Welcome everyone. Hi, Shara. Yeah. Hey, Chris, nice to see you. Hey, Ben. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rob, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Hey, Ben, uh, before we get started, well, that's where we started, uh, but I saw your email that came through a couple minutes ago. Um, uh, it's on me. I have not produced those minutes yet. I was out of the country last week um, and have just been getting caught up and there are a number of things at the top of my list and, you know, <laughs> so many, too many number one priorities. Understood. Yeah. Uh, I suppose we can approve those meeting minutes ne next time around. Yeah, that won't be a problem. Great. I do have the recording up. Um, so if people are chomping the bit to see what happened in that meeting, the recording is available for everybody to view. All right, perfect. All right. We'll just give it a few more minutes. I, we know that this week is likely to be a lighter week. We have um, quite a few members who are unable to join this week, but we are going to see if we're able to make quorum and uh, keep keep everything moving. And Dominic, just checking in with you, um, quorum for this group would be five or six. You're on mute. Um, I'm going to double check the uh, procedures, but I'm pretty sure it's fine. Okay. Either way, it looks like we have six, so it looks like we do have quorum. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Let me one, two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. All right. And thank you, Ben, for stepping in today in Mia's stead. Of course. Uh, I'll I'll hand it over to you to open the meeting. Great. Yeah. So, uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, the uh, August 6th, the meeting of the Clean Heat Standard Equity Advisory Group. Um, I am Ben Belaski. I'm the uh, acting chair for the meeting, uh, stepping in for Mia Watson, who is uh, at a conference. Um, yeah, so uh, this week we are uh, going to skip on uh, the review and approval of the uh, meeting minutes. Um, and we will uh, push that off till next meeting to get the official approval on those. Um, today we're going to uh, we're going to get some updates from the uh, PUC from Dominic. Uh, then we're also going to have a few different discussions today um, about um, a number of issues in front of us, including uh, the uh, conversation about minorities, peoples of color, and indigenous populations in Vermont. Um, we're also going to have a conversation with uh, TAG representative uh, Michelle Keller uh, on the topic of pacing. And uh, we're going to also um, begin uh, diving into the topic of uh, have an initial conversation about uh, moderate income households, uh, followed by some updates from our credit issues subgroup uh, that met last week and uh, also the public engagement subgroup update. Um, so yeah, so I guess to kick us off, uh, um, Dominic, do you want to 
Let's start by giving us some updates from the PUC. Absolutely. Um, so the most pressing thing is the um, Vermont Fuel Dealers Association filed a motion to reconsider on the interim credit ownership decision that the commission put out. Um, that automatically triggers a 15-day response period um, for all participants in the case. So uh, if anyone would like to weigh in on um, the initial ownership standards um, for any reason, you've got until August uh, 27th. Uh, we would definitely encourage engagement specifically with uh, what uh, the VFDA uh, motion talks about so we can discuss those um, specific issues. But of course, um, once you're going through and making that filing, we encourage you to uh, lay out all comprehensive thoughts. The uh, feedback period for um, our, the sorry, I've got too many tabs open. I'm trying to find the right language. Uh, the feedback for the staff proposal on credit fulfillment plans, criteria and non-compliance and waiver process um, closed late last week. So the commission is currently digesting those. Um, and then I will just give people a heads up to say that the uh, next staff proposal we see coming out is going to be uh, what we are colloquially calling life cycle of a credit. So, you know, we've, we've talked about ownership that is, of course, subject to that motion to reconsider. Uh, but once a credit uh, a project happens and a credit is eligible to be created, what does that look like and what are the rules from uh, registering that action and creating credits all the way through retiring those credits for compliance? So just as a heads up, that is the next thing that we believe we'll be putting out. We are also um, working quite hard on a request for information related to the DDA, but that has been um, tied up in a couple um, staff absences and so we're a little behind there. Aside from that, as Ben mentioned, uh, there are some people out at the uh, VCRD summit today, which that includes um, Deirdre Morris, who is there for the PUC staff, uh, as well as Ed McNamara, the chair, who will be speaking on a panel, panel about CHS and related efforts uh, at the PUC. So uh, hopefully there are some good conversations happening there, in addition to the good conversations we'll have here today. Happy to take any questions. Oh, did you mention what the what uh, forthcoming comment periods are going to be? Did you did you mention that or did I? Um, yes, that is the the life cycle of a credit. So uh, registration, verification, banking, trading, and retirement. And we uh, we had thought to initially put that out as one piece for verification and a separate piece for banking, training, and retirement. But as we have gotten deeper and deeper and deeper into the issue, um, it is very closely intertwined. And we're going to believe we believe that we're going to have to put it out put it out all as one, so people can um, think through the entire process and provide feedback that we can take straight into the rule. Thank you. Shira, you are muted. Thank you. Just asking if there's any more questions for Dom Dominic related to updates from the PUC. Great. Okay. And so I will hand, we will go into our quick updates um, from our tag liaisons. So Emily or Matt, if you have any updates. Um, so the main discussion in the, the last TAG meeting two weeks ago was almost completely around the draft potential study slides um, that were distributed and presented um, from NV5, um, the department's contracted entity that's doing the clean heat standard potential study. Um, and a lot of the questions that the TAG had revolved around understanding modeling assumptions and where the numbers came from to more further understand some of the costs in those draft slides. Um, 
and the TAG members did have an opportunity to write up questions to send to the department regarding those draft slides um, that was due last Monday. Um, and then, Ben, could you confirm the is the final draft that the TAG is going to see is that in August? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, def the actual final draft will be um, posted to the uh, EPUC uh, September first. Uh, but the uh, NV5 is currently working on, uh, you know, updating um, the the draft that was shown, um, you know, fine tuning that. Uh, and so in late, uh, yeah, late August, we'll be getting another iteration to check out. Yes. Cool. And that's all I had. Um, and I can hand it over to Matt. Yeah, just to follow up on that summary is to say that the bottom line number, of course, was had us all scratching our chins, wondering how we ever get to that number. Um, that understood is kind of later, but also some of the assumptions built in, I think there were legitimate questions asked by um, asked by those participants. And I think NV5 uh, took those under consideration. And I look forward to seeing the next draft to clarify exactly how you get to $17.3 billion over the next um, 25 years and why some of the assumptions, particularly with renewable energy, uh, renewable fuels, um, why they were made. So more to come. And were most, were most of the EAG members able to attend that tag meeting? Okay, there's a couple who aren't. Um, from the ones who were not, do you have any, any questions about um, the presentation or um, any specifics around the numbers? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. There was a, um, a modeling assumption about um, manufactured home replacement. That kind of caught me off guard. Did anybody have any uh, further detail that, they, that, that was shared at that meeting? Are you asking if the they uh, presented about manufactured home replacement or? Well, in, in the modeling, they had included that there was an assumption that manufactured housing would be replaced uh, as part of the clean heat standard. And I haven't seen anything that um, backs up that assumption. And I just, I was trying to understand how that how that was factored in. That was, that just hasn't been anything I've heard discussed uh, as part of this. Yeah, so that'll be, um, you know, there's, with any potential study, there's of course you know thousands of uh, assumptions made to, you know, come up with a projected, uh, you know, future uh, path forward to meeting the goals. Um, but yeah, they it is required in statute that the potential study takes into account um, the low and moderate income uh, specific measures. Um, so the manufactured home replacement is part of that. Um, so they didn't present specifically on that measure, but they did um, look at, you know, manufactured housing data um, in Vermont, you know, you know, number of houses and um, condition of those uh, mobile homes, et cetera, to come up with a number of, um, you know, an assumption on what uh, population of mobile homes is uh, or would be eligible to be replaced over the um, time horizon of the study. So um, when they, uh, NV5, you know, does present or um, deliver their final uh, draft, there will be, you know, workbooks and um, basically more information to come on that um, than the specific assumptions that were made uh, on that. So. Um, Thanks, Ben. Do, do, you, do, you, do you have a sense, like, it, it also kind of caught me off guard a little bit that a, um, a model was kind of put into place and the equity advisory group is still beating. So how how do you how do you build a model uh, that has the equity built into it um, when it kind of it kind of it it goes back to that theme of we kind of seem to have two dueling tracks like we have equity advisory group doing their work and in the meantime programs being designed independently and the two aren't uh, interwoven. I just mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't see the word equity too often in the report. Yeah, so it's uh, the potential study is mostly looking at the um, they presented on you know technical potential for example. So they're really uh, in large part a lot of those assumptions are you know uh, irrespective of um, you know 
so equity would be sort of not included in that. It's just looking at the straight up, you know, technical potential of each measure, for example, uh, or the maximum achievable looking at, you know, basically number of houses in Vermont, um, number of heating systems that could potentially be replaced uh, with clean, you know, uh, with a heat pump, for example. Um, you know, and then breaking it down. So as far like, I mean, they're actually even modeling like, you know, faucet aerators. Like there's... Uh, a tremendous amount of, like I mentioned, uh, thousands of assumptions being uh, input into the model. But um, yeah, so it's really looking at just like what is, uh, you know, technically feasible, um, you know, is one of the big things that they presented on. So equity uh, really isn't necessarily baked into that just because it's, um, it's more looking at just the, like what's physically possible on the ground um, in, in, in that sense, so yeah, the, uh, the that there will be some light shed on that when they look deeper into uh, you know the uh, LMI specific measures, um, such as um, measures that can be installed in multifamily properties, uh, mobile homes, etc. So, yeah. cool. thanks, sir. And and I I would just add if I could that the number is big and it's kind of incomprehensible. But the way I've tried to explain it to people who are very concerned about whatever this tax or fee will be, which is to say $17.3 billion is the estimate of the amount of economic activity that has to happen in the next 25 years in order to comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act. It does not mean that's the tax because we'd be looking at $10 a gallon heating oil and that's not going to happen. Um, so I've tried to calm people down who have just done the quick math and gone, well, $17.3 billion is is a is a big number and it is so they're going to pare that down and then find out what actually needs to happen to move the market and i think where the where our group comes in is if is if we think that their assumptions are too low for what it would take to convince someone yeah. to for instance buy a manufactured house with a 500 hundred dollar rebate get someone to buy a new manufactured house probably not um would it be enough to get them a heat pump maybe but that's one of those things that the next level, the next level of, of study will give us more information on. John, I thought I saw your hand up or maybe it was just a motion. Okay, no worries. And and I also forgot to just announce that um thank you so much, Rob, for joining joining us. Um Rob is joining on behalf of Jack, who couldn't be here today. So thank you so much for stepping in. Um, any other questions uh, for our tag liaisons? We will have an opportunity to go a little bit further with um, Michelle Keller, who is coming in. She'll be coming in at around 1.20 um, and speaking a little bit more um, about this and also pacing issues and um, other tag related issues. Anything else in the meantime? Okay, great. So I will move us over to our next piece. So we did want to, um, first of all, for the conversations with minority, uh, continued conversations on minority Vermont, minorities, Vermonters of color and indigenous populations, uh, we are going to have a abbreviated conversation. We are going to continue that conversation later on. We had another scheduling um, trouble with uh, Virg Virginie, uh, that was definitely our fault. So we we really appreciate her um, and her time um, trying to, to work with us. So we will be able to meet with her uh, at the next meeting, which will be even better because hopefully we'll have more of our representatives there for that meeting. But in the meantime, we did want to go back um, as Emily suggested and touch base on the Vermonters of color, minorities and indigenous populations, as well as the renters and um, rental home, no, not the rent renters and rental home owners, the, yes, the renters and rental home owners, um, so that we can um, add additional information from Efficiency Vermont. So I will go ahead and share that um, link with you again. Sure. I did send an email. Um, Efficiency Vermont representatives on these topics 
scheduling just didn't work out before this meeting for me to be able to share data, um, but that is coming. So um, I will send an email out in advance when I can be in touch with the right, the right people to share the right data and information. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, then we will still go ahead and open both of, open the document and see if there's any additional information to put in either on Vermonters of color or the renters and rental home owners. Um, and let me go ahead and share. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, Yes. Yeah, so is there any additional information that we want to add? Any additional questions that we have? Um, starting in Vermonters of color, minorities, and indigenous populations. Sure, if you'd like me to take the notes, uh, I'm just going to need access to the document. And I'll go ahead and make it open for everyone. Okay, we can move on and just touch base again on renters and renter, rental home owners. Is there anything else that needs to be added? Okay. Emily, I see you shaking your head no. So <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I will open it up for public comment at this point. We, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, do we have any comments from the public? Go ahead, Ron. And just before you start, we we try to uh, keep our comments to two minutes or less. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and see if anyone else has a comment. And then if there isn't anyone else, then we can circle back to you. Um, so go okay. ahead. Sounds good. Uh, I'm Ron McGarvey. I live in Burlington. I am retired, but my professional career has focused on energy conservation and energy efficiency. I retired from Efficiency Vermont as the Director of Residential Energy Services. I'm currently the President of the Board of Vermont Interfaith Power and Light. This is a nonprofit whose mission is to empower Vermont faith communities and spiritual communities to advocate and to act for climate and our earth. We seek to help faith communities to take actions in their houses of worship, their homes, their workplaces, to reduce their carbon emissions and to conserve energy, use it more efficiently and to increase their use of renewable energy. As a faith-based organization, we have a moral responsibility to stand up for earth and for those burdened by high energy costs. We support the clean heat standard because fossil fuel heating is one of our largest sources of carbon emissions. For the future of our children and our earth, we need to transition away from fossil fuels. We support clean heat standards because we're now experiencing the de devastating impacts of these carbon emissions. We cannot delay this transition. We support clean heat standard rules 
that will enable low and moderate income Vermonters to have a just and equitable transition away from fossil fuels. My experience is Efficiency Vermont has been an example of effective energy policy that has had an impact on electricity use and carbon emissions. Efficiency Vermont has helped retailers, contractors, wholesalers, and customers transition to more efficient electrical equipment. We, support, seconds. we support clean heat standard rules that will create a effective program similar to Efficiency Vermont, but for fossil fuel heating. We cannot afford to delay or inaction. The costs of delay and inaction far exceed any costs of effective clean heat standard rules. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more public comments? Would anyone like to respond to Ron? Thank you for your comments, Ron. There, um, we hear you. So thank you, making your voice heard. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So we've moved. We've moved through pretty quickly. We didn't have much to add um, to the previous um, the previous sections, and we still have about. 20 minutes before Michelle joins us. So I think we can skip ahead and go into a conversation. So we're doing the initial conversation and question formula, form, formulation around moderate income households. Um, and I will scroll to that section. I think we'll probably have more on the when Virginie uh, does have a chance to come and talk to us. We'll definitely have more to add to that section. I think. Definitely. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into this. Emily, do you mind giving us a quick overview of um of the section? Sure. Um, I kept this pretty high level. Um. Just to start, um, I don't want to just read through the whole outline, um, but um, I guess starting at the um, at the assumptions, we included that there are assumptions that um, programs should re require moderate income households to hold some financial burden of an energy transition when receiving an incentive, um, and I think just to to add some more words to that, um, that's just experience that efficiency has that that assumption is a huge gap in um, in the transition to energy efficient homes and just in the energy transition. Um, renters were a part of this. Um, so circling back to renters are often locked out of clean heat benefits um, as they don't hold the decision. And I know we've talked about that in the in the renter section of, of this document. Um, but I think including renters as a population within moderate income um, Vermonters is an important call out. Um, and then potential benefits, um, increased funding could be directed towards incentives for installed clean heat measures. Um, this increase of funding could lead to an increase of those measures in moderate income households making it more affordable. Um, programs today with a 10% income match for moderate income households need increased incentives to increase the program numbers, increasing supply and demand, increased incentives will reduce the upfront purchasing cost of a clean heat measure. Um, and then potential harms, um, customer confusion. This is something that um, Efficiency Vermont has written about before and is um, and important from Efficiency Vermont's um, experience with with the, the customer experience. Um, so if there are too many pre 
programs and competing opportunities that aren't aligned and clearly communicated, um, there's increased potential for negative experiences and understanding what existing programs um, and opportunities there are. Um, and so communication around um, territories, um, geographic territories, um, different um, providers, um, and then strategically aligning programs to make sure that um, there's a statewide coverage and a long-term experience um, that just ensures participation, first of all, and then um, participation that is helpful and not a burden to the consumer or the customer. Um, and so for recommendations, we had uh, market transformation activities to be funded through the Clean Heat Standard. Um, these activities support low and moderate income Vermonters, um, workforce development in the Clean Heat Standard could support moderate income Vermonters um, that participate in, in the workforce. So um, creating a stable working environment versus an unstable one with a burst of funding for these projects versus long-term um, stability. Um, and then market transformation activities would also support a statewide consistent experience of low and moderate income Vermonters navigating clean heat projects. Thank you, Emily. Um, and I'd like to invite us to start thinking about what ways um, moderate income households would be differently affected by the clean heat standard um, in, in ways that we haven't thought of for in, in ways that are different from low income households and some of the other populations that we have already um, talked about what is what are some specific challenges that um, moderate income households might feel or um, specific gaps that um, you know blind spots that they might fall into um, if we don't specifically call them out. Yeah, go ahead, Pike. Yeah, I don't know about all the eligibility requirements for the various organizations out there, but um, moderate income folks might not be eligible for, say, um, rent subsidization or LIHEAP or other things. And again, I'm, I'm speaking out of ignorance here. I don't know, but that's a possibility. Thank you. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I think there is, uh, well, the, the way the Queen Heat Standard is written, uh, you know, low income is defined as 60% AMI and, and lower. Um, so there's going to be, and moderate income would be 60 to 120% AMI. So there's going to be a portion, you know, that 60 to 80 percent AMI that is, uh, you know, eligible for a weatherization assistance program. Um, and the the folks between 80 and 120 percent will not be. So um, kind of, yeah, getting at what Pike was just mentioning, you know, there's going to be basically a, a cliff of uh, benefits that, uh, uh, yeah, moderate income folks have to contend with to you know, help support uh, financial support for the projects. So uh, many of them will have to resort to financing uh, for those, which there is low income or low uh, percentage, you know, interest financing options. I know from like Efficiency Vermont and others, but uh, that's definitely a real, you know, having that benefit cliff is real for that group. Thank you, Ben. So maybe one of the things that we should do between now and our next conversation on moderate households is um, try to figure out what some of those specific benefits are um, that that might not be afforded to the moderate income households um, that would still pose as a challenge um, once the clean hate standard goes into effect. Uh, Carl, I see your hand. Um, I'm going to wait until we open up the public uh, public comment period to come to you uh, and leave this time for the EAG members. Um, anyone else from the EAG? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, I'd be remiss not to call out um, 
Vermont's um, severe housing shortage and the impact to household income, um, whether that's somebody who has recently been able to access um, home ownership market, uh, they usually deplete their reserves and they are now cash poor. And so um, while they have an asset uh, that's appreciating value, they're a their, their, their cash on hand to convert uh, a home uh, that, if anybody is familiar with Vermont's housing stock, understands how old it is. Um, and so converting from a um, fossil fuel heating source, um, it, it's just, again, it's a, it, it's a cash on hand uh, to switch. Um, very, you know, and that's, Similar to with renters, where um, they're you know they're um, we've already kind of talked about you know uh, the disadvantages of staying and renting, but just being able to access home ownership so that they can have that freedom, um, having the cash on hand just to access the market. So they're kind of stuck in these um, these, these old um, energy expensive uh, rental housing. It's just um, it's a, it's just a, I don't know. It's, it's hard to see that on paper. And I don't think uh, everyone here kind of agrees that we want to make that transition uh, to um, electric, but there are real barriers to doing that. So just saying we need to be equitable doesn't, um, I don't know. Yeah. Just, we can't just say it's going to be equitable. We have to uh, come up a way with these folks in the moderate income uh, to be able to make that transition. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Or questions that we might want to ask? Of, of an expert or things that we might want to further look into. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. I guess uh, the question, you know, the, the logical follow up to, you know, I think what all the all three of our comments, Pike, Chris and mine just now is really how can we what kind of capacity in terms of uh, you know, funding uh, and additional resources do programs need to be able to uh, serve this moderate income population? Um, you know, it, is it a matter of, uh, you know, funding, you know, basically expanding funding, uh, you know, or eligibility for the low income uh, benefit, the uh, programs that low income folks are able to take advantage of, you know, so that moderate income folks can, or is it, you know, creating, you know, new programs, uh, energy efficiency and, um, you know, incentive programs for the moderate income folks that are specifically tailored to them. So, I mean, I guess what I would be interested in, um, you know, or having a conversation with maybe some folks at, uh, you know, Efficiency Vermont or, um, you know, that might be able to talk about what they have uh, for or, or Emily, I don't know if you could think of some folks you work with that, um, you know, I know you guys are a large organization, of course. So, um, but yeah, I guess what additional resources are needed to serve that population is kind of where the next where my mind's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. I'm happy to talk more about. Um, what what incentives and rebates exist um, that Efficiency Vermont um, provides. And um, I can share a couple links in the chat right now that kind of gives an overview of existing EVP programs. Um, I think that um, in terms of thinking about like what's needed and uh, existing programs and whatnot, I think, um, Efficiency Vermont does have programs and uh, in our comments where we've definitely thought about and um, what would it take to have incremental 
additional um, projects completed under the clean heat standard within these existing programs. Um, and I would just advocate for aligning existing programs um, versus starting new ones, knowing that um, both um, the low incomes and the programs in the state of Vermont, as well as um, energy efficiency programs that serve low income and moderate income populations have experience and background in doing that. Um, so I guess I'm just advocating for the alignment of those existing programs in terms of efficiency and affordability and um, having that, that background and knowledge of who to reach out to. Um, so if we have specific questions about um, understanding who is currently reached out to and um, you know, I've shared some gaps um, that exist in terms of reaching out to, and we've talked as a group about gaps in, in Vermonters that are reached in all sorts of programs, but the low income and moderate income programs. Um, but yeah, I'll share those resources. And if we have more questions, I'm happy to bring in um, program experts at Efficiency Vermont regarding um, data on who's, who's already been reached with these programs and maybe who isn't. So if you have specific questions, I think feel free to ask them now or email them and we can think about who to reach out to next. Does anyone else have specific questions or thoughts or um, other areas where we, we know that there's a question there, but we don't quite have the information needed um, to to have the whole to have the full picture. I have a question, but it dips into credit ownership a little bit. Um, so I'll defer to the subject matter experts here. So we kind of Ben did a nice job of just kind of outlining the the income ranges. Um, so really, everybody under one hundred twenty percent is you know uh, would get focus through clean heat standard. But the and the pacing and I guess the credit ownership of you know this whole um we'll do 16% um and we'll we'll divide them into these buckets. I was looking at some of the data that Mia had sent around about the income distribution in the state. You know, I didn't really fully appreciate that half of Vermonters make 70 two for two person household make under 75,000 like that, that's half of Vermont. And yet when we talk about who would um, receive kind of the, the benefits from some of these, these credits, it's, it's not proportional to uh, the income distribution in the state. And that just, I don't know, that just kind of popped. And we have these existing programs uh, targeted to these individuals. Um, some coordination of those programs would be nice, but really shifting if we need to redistribute the funds to the targeted population uh, higher than the, the, the current plan right now. Um, I, I don't know if that, does that make sense? It just, if half of Vermont falls under this, this bucket, but we're not, half of Vermont wouldn't benefit from the CHS initially uh, or is not prioritized, I just the gap I'm, having a hard time reconciling. You're referring to the uh, LMI, the statutory requirement that there's yeah. a certain percentage of obligated party, uh, basically emission reductions come from low and moderate income. So yeah, uh, that is a yearly requirement or annual requirement um, yeah. that they must meet. So yeah, it is a good question. You're, are you essentially uh, getting at the fact that maybe those need to be increased to kind of meet the need um, more immediately or? Well, because yeah. you're going to increase the energy burden for folks until they're able to access the benefit of the program. So just uh, how do we speed that up so that they're able to access it? Because how how long do we want really want to um, increase the energy burden for somebody um, until the program catches up to them. In the meantime, market rate can access those benefits uh, more expeditiously. Expeditiously, um, that's uh, that was just some standout data.
because these programs as designed doesn't doesn't get us there. Like these are programs. I love everything about what all these organizations are doing, um, but it's not it's not getting us there. Um, and I don't know that market transformation activities is a um, I, I don't know how that changes the trajectory so that half of Vermont who who would be see a higher energy burden um, can adopt these changes on a faster pace. Emily, I see your hand. I also saw Matt's hand earlier. Um, Matt, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I apologize. I thought I'd be in a, in a not not moving, but I'm got to get to my office. Um, it's very easy, and we all fall into this, including myself, of thinking that the clean heat standard is an electrification program. I want to say this as clearly as possible I can while I'm driving through Addison County. It is not. It is not. Period. Underscore. Old. It is a program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the thermal sector. And for 40% of Vermonters who choose oil heat, it may have a new boiler or furnace. You're right. It's ludicrous to think that they would spend between $6,000 and $20,000 electrifying their home so they could have electric heat when they could have a, car, a fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and receives clean heat credits. So a lot of these conversations are based on whatever we determine, not we, but the PUC determines, uh, receives credit from a renewable fuel standpoint. If they view that renewable diesel should score well and should be received credit, then 100,000 homeowners are, aren't going to face an energy burden. Um, so it, there's a lot at stake determining when we determine if it's equitable based on information we don't have yet, which is what is the PUC going to say about renewable liquid fuels and whether or not they deserve credit under this scheme? Because if they say no biofuels at all, it's all going to be electrification, that it is electrification program. And I would argue there's a much simpler way to do all this, but that's not what we got. We don't have a simple thing. We have a complex policy that's supposed to put all uh, fuels that reduce greenhouse gas emissions into that basket so that mo more people can benefit. And for 100,000 Vermont homes, it could be renewable diesel. Thank you, Matt. Emily. If anyone had anything related to what Matt was saying, you can jump ahead of me. I was just responding um, to Chris. Okay. Um, I was just going to add that um, totally understand all of Chris's perspective and just adding some color to the market transformation piece. Um, that's there not as a, this is what is what's, what it's going to take. Um, in terms of all of the recommendations, but just just a side note that um, Efficiency Vermont, thinking about um, moderate income and moderate income reach, we were just noting that that is a really critical piece of being able to reach more um, middle income Vermonters, but totally support and understand what Chris was saying. Um, Thank you, Emily. Uh, let's take a moment to open it up to public comment. As I as I stated before, um, we'll give everyone two minutes to state their comment, and then we'll check in to see if there's anyone else who has comments. And if there aren't any, we are very happy to circle back. We'll go ahead and get started with Carl, um, and then we can um, see if there's any other public comments. So go ahead, Carl. Carl, did you still have a comment to make? If you are speaking, uh, we cannot hear you. Okay, are there any other public comments? OK, 
Okay, great. Oh, Sam, I see your hand. Go ahead. Sam, if you're speaking. Yep, yep. I just needed to get off mute. Um, hi, my name is Sam Swanson. I live in uh, South Burlington. And uh, I've been, I came in late. So, uh, and I apologize for that. And, but I am uh, have reviewing the, the, dis the discussion and I welcome this care careful attention to the details of trying to achieve these important objectives. Uh, I come to this uh, public comment period as a uh, member of a faith community in South Burlington and also been active in the statewide uh, Interfaith Power and Light uh, program that is, supports this. Um, I think the, the difficulties you guys are wrestling with, the issues that you're wrestling with uh, are extremely important. Um, our community strongly supports the effort to sort this out. Uh, I don't know, having heard the comments by Matt, which address uh, some pretty sticky issues with dealing with uh, the non-electric options, which I think have to be sorted out along with the, the electric option. Uh, welcome that attention, but our overarching uh, uh, concern and interest is to support the kinds of things you guys are, are talking about, okay? making sure that the people who are least able uh, to address the objectives of uh, converting to uh, uh, from uh, to low to low carbon uh, heating systems have the resources. Uh, they're often the people who uh, suffer the most from climate change and uh, you, we've seen it over and over again in the rural flooding uh, in Vermont. And, uh, and um, I'll leave it there. I think we're, I wanted to say, just keep up the good work. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing how this unfolds. Thank you so much, Sam. Does anyone else have a public comment or question? Okay, does any EAG member have a response uh, for Sam? Yes, uh, no direct response, but again, uh, appreciate the comments. Always like, love hearing from the public and um, yeah, thanks for attending the meeting. Thank you so much. And I see that we have a few more, Emily has sent a few more um, links for us to look at. So I'll go ahead and put those in the document as well. And then I will, uh, Dominic, are you are you good on the, the edits? Okay, so I will go ahead and make this non-editable. And I see we now have Michelle Keller. Thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. We'll go ahead and move on to um, speaking with Michelle. Let me stop sharing. There we go. And uh, Michelle is going to uh, discuss some of the TAG recommendations and the equity implications of the PUC pacing straw proposal. And um, we really intend this to be a discussion to, to get a little bit more in, in depth and like the collaboration between um, the EAG and, and the TAG. And if there's any questions that TAG members have for Michelle, or that EAG members have for Michelle, please, please, um, please ask her. And Michelle, if you have any specific questions for the EAG, uh, feel free. But with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much for being able to join us. Well, thank you, Ashira, and thank you to all the members of the Equity Advisory Group for inviting me to be here. Uh, the TAG welcomes this collaboration and recognizes that this is something that I trust this is just the beginning of us continuing to have more conversations. Uh, I will credit, we appreciate the updates that Emily and Matt have been bringing to the TAG um, with respect to what this group is doing. Uh, before I begin, I do have some summary slides for what was involved in the 
um, developing the tag response to the Public Utility Commission's pacing straw proposal. Um, before I do that, does this group, anybody already have questions or particular points that you want to make sure that we cover today? Sounds like a well, no. Okay. Um, I take it I'll be okay to share my screen? Yes, you should. All right. Tech glitches, just a moment. There we go. All right, is that coming through? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Well, thank you all. And I'm going to begin the same way we have begun um, each of the meetings of the, the pacing subgroup. So for a little bit of, of context, uh, the full tag has been working in conjunction with um, the commission. And when a revised work plan came out in the middle of April of this year, you can see on the screen here, it laid out eight tasks uh, in what was a new sequence from what had been in the original proposals when the Clean Heat Standard was launched. And both your um, advisory group and the TAG advisory group began working. So initially, there was a credit creation step, there was a pacing step. And with April, they came and actually broke things out in and turned pacing into a two-step into two separate tasks. And to put this into better context for all of you, the clean heat standard has all sorts of requirements for what uh, will take place in order to prepare the state to have new, uh, to reduce the amount of fossil fuel that's used across the state over a specific timeline. So this is where the commission was trying to break things down into their whole lot of new procedures that need to be set up. There are a whole lot of considerations and decisions to be made before things can begin two years from when the, the um, law was enacted to actually put that in place. So they went back and took a look at things. And after obtaining initial comments for their second task of pacing, they came back with a revision. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is the part one which they put together to address these key, these key steps in preparing for a clean heat standard implementation. So one of the first things that was asked of the commission was to set up what's called an emission schedule. And I will preface this with, we've had all sorts of conversations. This is actually a table. Uh, it's going to end up being a booklet, but putting together a, a list of what sorts of measures would be accepted, um, clean heat standard, fossil fuel reduction measures, and put those together in a table along with what their impact would be for reducing emissions. They also had a second step to tabulate, and there are specifics in the statute for um, reduce, for relying on fossil fuels that have lower and low for lower carbon intensity values over time. So there was a separate task to address those. A few milestones are defined in statute, but more details were needed. Uh, step three in what the Public Utilities Commission put together was to come up with the, the rate of emissions reduction requirements over the periods of time that were specified in statute. Then the these last two are actually quite lengthy in steps. And then their fourth step was to fill out the details about how they would come up with the specific annual requirements for the obligated parties, in this case, the fuel dealers, as one example, for what their required reductions would be for each year. 
and I can't see everyone who's on here. There are plenty who can speak to in much more detail to that. Um, and step five in their pacing was to ensure that we are meeting the, basically the numbers are the 16%, the, the equitable distribution requirements that are in the statute for low and middle income customers. And for the purposes of the straw proposal that came out in May, that piece has not been addressed. And it would be, that's one thing that I would like to understand what this group thinks about when all of the parties involved would be able to deal with that. Because at this point in time, without some of the previous things defined and also what the costs of ensuring we meet those distribution requirements, um, we're not able to even consider making calculations for that. So I will say I welcome, I welcome questions as we go here. I'm going to move on to a bit more detail for each of the first four bullets here. But um, please, members of the equity advisory group, uh, let's make this a discussion rather than a presentation. So the, the first task was to set up that emission schedule. And there are technical consultants who are working on that right now. And the commission is mandated to ensure that this is set up so that it's reviewed every three years um, and 10 years. And that involves the, the list of measures and also the projected savings and requirements, or I should say emissions reductions and requirements for each of the obligated parties. The emission schedule is just coming out. The I would have liked to have even a list. We're going to be discussing some of that at the TAG meeting on Thursday of this week. So I'm not sure, does the, has the equity advisory group, have you had the same issues where we've got, um, there are a number of parallel things taking place. So the TAG is reviewing the steps, what's required in statute, the progress that the commission is making, and then the contributions for, there are two separate technical consultants that right now are working on both the potential study for what emissions are theoretically possible in the state over the time frame that we're looking at for this clean heat standard. And then there's another technical consultant that's working, doing a line by line on what would be approved measures and what associated reductions would be connected to each of those. I see some nods. Does anyone want want to speak to that? The kind of parallel um, parallel tasks that are going on and and how that it's working. Those were some exact words I had used earlier <laughs> in this meeting, Michelle. Oh. Uh, just uh, so I appreciate you reciting or saying those words. Um, parallel is just it, it. It does feel like just from an equity advisory group perspective, like when we saw that, I saw the MV5 report that came out, it, it just felt like that was going on and uh, on, on a path that wasn't uh, informed by some of the work that our group was doing in the meantime. Ben did a nice uh, kind of elaboration of, you know, uh, some assumptions that they have to make as part of their modeling, but um, just the, particularly the cost has been, um, you know, kind of prohibitive uh, to help us do some more work so far. When you say the costs, so the numbers that are coming out of the reports? Just the actual, so I think the, the biggest impact, at least for me, when I, when I try to do some community outreach, hey, uh, I'm talking to folks in, the, um, in our community who would, hey, how would you, what are your thoughts on this? Is there some good or some bad? Like, what do you, what's your, the, the biggest uh, thing that stops conversation is, well, what, how's this going to impact me? Like day one, what's this mean for me? And that's, um, <clears throat> it's hard to describe right now because there's so much unknown. Um, and so folks have a hard time weighing in one way or another. Um, cause I, I don't know until I know how it impacts me and 
So exactly. Yeah. Now we have been uh, discussing, you know, the, just the idea of low and moderate income credit, you know, front loading of that requirement for uh, obligated parties in the credit issues subgroup. Um, we have drafted a, a memo um, on our thoughts on that, but you know, really, uh, by and large, you know, there is, as you kind of alluded to, there's we, there's a few key pieces of information that we need to, uh, you know, to begin to do any sort of calculation that would show, okay, we need to you know, ramp that up by, you know, X percentage, um, you know, from based from what's in statute, it's really, um, without, you know, knowing more information, you can't really, um, you know, put a number of as to how much the percentage should be increased. But, um, you know, I think we all agree broadly that, uh, you know, the more, uh, you know, low and moderate income folks that we can be, um, that can benefit or can be served, you know, by, um, you know, or yeah, can have essentially clean heat measures installed in their house, the better. Um, but, uh, you know, how do you do that without, you know, you got to find that balance where the obligated parties and, um, and field dealers are able to uh, actually achieve the numbers that are set out. You know, you don't want to make the target so high that no one's able to hit their targets. So, um, yeah, it's definitely an ongoing discussion from that, um, that perspective. And, and, you know, of course, as we move along here in the next couple of months, there's going to be quite a bit of information with the, you know, the final uh, draft of the potential study, for example, will mm -hmm. give us a sense of what that uh, potential is for um, these measures that, you know, can serve the low income, low and moderate income uh, section of the population. So, yeah, um, we've yeah definitely been having similar conversations, but less technical, uh, to be sure. So. Both sides are important. Both sides are so important in these. I will admit we've been on the tag side, we have been spending a lot of time in the details of the the last part of the bullet here where the schedule must be based, based on uh, some sort of a specific platform of appropriate analytical rigor to fit the Vermont thermal context and the, the nuance is there just of how how things are calculated, and we'll get into these later, um, is one of the reasons that the, that the TAG has several subcommittees now. So that that part, as has been mentioned, we, we the, will be informed by, partly by the potential study being done by NV5 that Chris referred to. And there's also um, the emission schedule is being prepared by Opinion Dynamics. So, uh, as I said, we're expecting to see a, another draft of that on Thursday. So I'll have more information about the specific measures. Um, the other top, the next line item that was within the commission's uh, proposed uh, straw proposal, uh, didn't mean to be redundant there, is that the statute talks about using a carbon intensity value for fossil fuels. Um, they're taught using a, a starting point of existing heating oil right now is considered 100, looking that um, as we move on to 2050, that the amount of greenhouse gas emissions permitted would be, the targets would be set to get it below 20, below 80 for 2025, below 60 and 2030. And then the overall target is to get it below 20 in 2050. So this particular line item in their straw proposal was stating that given all that we've talked about here and much that we've been talking about in the, in the tag is that we do not have a whole lot of detail to determine exactly what sort of a slope we would want. So for the, what's proposing is we start with the, start at 80 for 2025 and just make a step change down to 60 for 2030. And hopefully we'd know more um, after that. And if we know more before that, we can of course adjust things as we go, but that was their proposal was a step change for the first five years. And TAG was all right with that and revisit that after 2030. 
Any questions there? So this would be applied to the, the fuel mix that we're seeing going through the, um, for all of the obligated parties here. I guess I do have a, just, you know, since we're on this slide here, Matt, you might be able to answer this question. Um, is there a renewable diesel alternative for kerosene or a renewable diesel-esque alternative for kerosene that, you know, because it just occurred to me as these step changes occur, will we effectively be, you know, eliminating the ability for, you know, can kerosene, because we know biofuels, of course, being outside tanks, biofuels might gel up and et cetera. But is there an alternative for kerosene? No. Yeah, so that. No, we're seeing kerosene in homes go to propane and very rapidly. But propane is a fossil fuel. There's renewable propane, but it's not available in the same abundance as renewable diesel and biodiesel. Um, can, can I step back about the parallel track while I, people are listening to me, sort of, which is there's another parallel track, which is the response from the obligated parties, which I encourage everyone in the EAG to read and to, and to offer criticism or feedback, either to the public or to me directly. Because I think this is the existential problem with the clean heat standard. If it's going to pass, it structurally needs to change. Because as the straw proposal was laid out by the Public Utility Commission, we're in fact the obligated parties, those that deliver fossil fuels in Vermont, and are also capable of delivering clean heat measures, are treated as if they were electric utilities, which makes sense from the perspective of the electric utility regulator. But it doesn't make any sense from the perspective of those that bring fuels into Vermont because having a 10-year plan or a three-year plan or a two-year plan or a 20-month plan, it's, it's ludicrous. Our industry operates every morning. We wake up, we have a cup of coffee, and we determine whether or not we're going to North Walpole or whether we're going to Springfield, Mass. And we don't set plans on how many uh, uh, gallons we're going to sell because we don't know what the weather's going to be and we don't know how many customers we're going to have. And we don't know if we can procure the gallons at the correct price or the price that will allow our customers to purchase our fuel. So we're suggesting a fundamental change in how the PUC regulates because they've never had to regulate deliverable fuels before. In fact, no utility has ever regulated fuel oil like this before. We are breaking ground. We're trying something brand new. Will it deliver the results that will stave off another lawsuit from the Global Warming Solutions Act? Perhaps, but we have to fundamentally change how we count gallons and how we count credits going forward. And those were the comments made in the straw proposal by some of the obligated parties. We sure hope the EAG reads them. We sure hope the PUC listens to them. And we hope that there's fundamental structural change in how this program works. Because all this discussion that we're having about buckets and 10 year plans and emissions projections, it won't matter uh, if we don't fix what's at the root of the problem here. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Pike, I also see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment about this slide um, and remind folks that these uh, declining rates um, are not, uh, do not apply for wood uh, and wood combustion. Um, so it is uh, doubly or triply or quadruply important that the carbon intensity value of wood be um, applied correctly at right from the start uh, because there is no reduction over time for wood burning. Um, DPS and the state of Vermont have a plan in their comprehensive energy uh, plan um, to increase wood combustion by uh, I think at least 50 percent um, even though it's the most carbon intense fuel that we use in Vermont. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there that there is no reduction once it's in place. Thanks. Thank you, Pike. See, I'll move on to the third item in the straw proposal, which was setting those thermal sector emissions reduction requirements. 
And there is a, I didn't include it here in today's slides, um, but there was a five-step process that basically started with the numbers that are currently tracked for the, the greenhouse, for the greenhouse gas inventory that's being calculated by the folks at DPS for the Global Warming Standards Act. Um, and using that, um, and Pike has been speaking to this quite a bit, so I'm not going to get into the into the details, but the, their steps are to start with the, the numbers that were that are already being uh, calculated for the greenhouse gas inventory, translating those from annual numbers to life cycle carbon emission numbers, and then put those into a formula to set the annual requirements for the obligated parties. This is also something that's in continuing discussion. We did provide comments to the, the PUC pointing out that we there are a number of both parallel developments, a little bit of moving targets. Um, Matt has spoken often about uh, starting with numbers. We're talking about basing things on fuel sales, and we're still, it's not clear how accurate those will be. Right now, the greenhouse gas data are the official numbers uh, come out. There's a significant time lag between when the, the calendar year ends and when those numbers formally come out. So um, still working out the details there. I was curious if any of the of this group's folks, uh, other than Matt, though Matt's welcome to, to speak to, um, had any concerns with the way these were being calculated. Yeah, go ahead, Pike. Oh, oh Pike. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the greenhouse gas inventory um, was created by statute 10 VSA 582G, and I would encourage everyone to read it, uh, read the statute. Um, that inventory is um, required to count uh, emissions from fossil fuels and biogenic sources. Um, ANR um, has failed to count biogenic emissions. So um, basing anything off the greenhouse gas inventory is really incorrect because ANR is, is calculating inventory incorrectly. Um, if you go back to the original act uh, back in 2012, ANR was supposed to uh, develop rules around the inventory process. Um, and over a decade later now, they still haven't done so and have, seem to have no plans to do so. So um, they're pursuing a policy that really violates uh, state statute. Thanks. Appreciate that perspective, Pike. And we have been, the TAG has met with, um, with the ANR folks who, are, who do these calculations right now. And part of our concern was that they too are looking to have the, the calculations evolve, ideally to be closer to matching what they should be requiring what's in statute, but also to better reflect some of the actual numbers that we'll be seeing. Uh, so that is something still in process. I, did, I do have my others. So the, the five steps are to start with the baseline. Um, linearly for the time being project the next 10 years of emissions reductions basically then superimpose that line on uh, a reconciliation or translation factor with the life cycle based trajectories and then come up with both a numerical figure for annual reductions requirements and what the and what the slope of that line should look like. Again, all of these numbers are waiting for some more information 
to come from the consultants. And as Pike said, perhaps even consent, continuing to understand how, what we use, what is used for the, for the baseline, whether it's the greenhouse gas inventory or something slightly modified. But as that was laid out, um, wrong one, the tag was basically asking to make sure that the Public Utility Commission did take all of these things that we are discussing now into account before making their final decision. And I'm looking at the time here. The fourth one was primarily laid out in statute with the credit requirements defined to be expressed as a percentage of each of the obligated parties contributions to emissions the previous year. Uh, PUC had a an eight step process which pretty much came out of statute and applied the percentages that are in that document to the numbers. Um, Matt has been a, a vocal advocate for clarifying, perhaps even changing statute so that we could um, better align those calculations with when the reporting comes out from the obligated parties when they understand when, what their sales are and also figuring out the best way that those will be adjusted each year so that the so that the fuel dealers have enough advance warning to do their their pricing for the for the upcoming heating season. And then again, the way the the LMI equitable distribution part, which is clearly stated in in the um, legislation, is not addressed in this pacing proposal, we presume it would be included definitely in the pacing two, which if I jump back, would be more when all of the details have been worked out as far as the, the rules for the, the operating procedures for the obligating parties, answering the questions about the credits. I know ownership is still in discussion um, and all of the other details. Did this group, your thoughts on the fact that this can't be addressed? I know Ben, you did talk a little bit at the beginning of our discussion here that we don't have enough information. Anything else that you folks here would like me to bring back to the tag with respect to what's been doing? And I'd like to turn this over to what would be a good mechanism for us to involve you? I know we've been trying to figure out how to apply the rubrics that you've developed. Yeah, and certainly, I think those the rubrics that we uh, that we did develop, um, you know, will. There'll be plenty of opportunity to utilize that both uh, in the tag and the EAG once, you know, uh, for example, the initial draft of the final rule comes out. Um, there'll be a lot, a lot to mull over there. And the, I think, you know, in that instance, for example, the, the, the rubric could be applied to that. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I mean, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, you know, memo that was drafted in our subgroup uh, regarding this, as I mentioned earlier, the equitable distribution of LMI. But um, yeah, so we'll be talking on that in a bit. Any other questions? So the, the TAG has submitted our formal, we did sub submit our formal uh, comments. Um, and are awaiting the next, you know, more information, seeing how the commission continues to develop all of these different components.
And with that, I complete my part of the, the presentation here. And again, I've kept it, I've kept it high level. If there, I it's my understanding that you've all seen the document that we prepared. Um, happy to provide copies of that again if if that would be helpful. Well, with that, do I turn it back to you, Ashira? Yes, you can. Um, I will, again, reiterate if there's any other questions. Uh, my plan of action is to turn it over to public comment for a little bit and then maybe go straight into the credit issues. And Michelle, um, if, you, if you'd if you like to stay, I think that that would be interesting for you as well to hear about and um, maybe you get into some fuller discussion around that as well. Um, Excellent, thank you. So before I go to public comment, I just wanna check and make sure if there's any other questions um, for Michelle on the um, pacing piece. Okay, and I'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Carl, I see your hand. Go ahead, Carl. And Carl, if you are speaking, we are unable to hear you. Carl, you're on mute still. Carl, if you're able to unmute, just feel feel free to speak into the room. Um, in the meantime, let's see if anyone else has a public comment or a question. Any other public comments or questions? Okay, let's wait a few moments to see if we can get Carl. Okay, Carl, since we know that you have a question, if at any time you're able to unmute, just feel free to speak into the room and we'll um, we'll pause so that you're able to get in that public comment. Um, but with that, we will move over to the credit issues subgroup um, to give us an update on what they've been working on. And um, Ben, I'll pass it over to you. And as you're starting, I'll go ahead and drop the two documents in the chat as well. That would be perfect. Um, yeah, so for uh, folks who haven't already taken a look, I know the I expect to I know the uh, EAG members uh, received copies of these in advance of the meeting. But um, yeah, so myself, Mia and uh, Matt uh, have been meeting and Emily joined us last meeting as well uh, to in the credit issues subgroup to uh, discuss really the broad topic of uh, low and moderate income front loading uh, front loading meaning uh, you know basically the uh, prioritization of low and moderate income uh, credits or uh, uh, credits coming from that population of folks um, so really the broader question is how can we um, increase the uh, uh, the ability for a larger percentage of this population to be served by obligated parties. Uh, so in the memo, what we laid out really is, um, you know, a little bit of background, uh, you know, statutory background on this uh, topic, citing the uh, section 8124D2 of the act, which is um, one that we're probably all quite familiar with at this point, which is uh, the uh, requirement that each obligated party should retire uh, sixteen percent from customers, sixteen percent of their uh, annual requirement from customers with low income, additional sixteen percent uh, from customers with low or moderate income. And from each of those groups, at least one half of those credits uh, needs to be installed clean heat measures uh, defined as you know measures that require a capital investment in homes and have measured lives of ten years or more. Um, as estimated by the uh, technical advisory group. Um, so 
Given that, you know, the background there um, and the specific language in the immediate section following the act there uh, that, um, you know, the commission shall, uh, to the extent re reasonably possible, front load the credit requirements for customers uh, live with, with low and moderate income. So the greatest portion of putting measures <clears throat> reaches Vermonters with low income and moderate income in the earlier years. So, you know, given that kind of context, we really... Uh, discussed this quite a bit, um, and we did in, uh, you know, just now talking with Michelle, you know, obviously we, um, sounds like both the technical advisor group as well as the EAG <clears throat> has identified that, you know, there does need to be some specific additional information uh, gathered to to really drill down on this. Uh, Srini, who's not uh, on the meeting today, but, you know, has pointed out that, you know, it'd be really great to have utilize a, um, a data-driven approach to um, determine, you know, basically how much, um, you know, these uh, uh, credits can be, you know, reasonably front-loaded, um, considering that there is that language in there that says the commission <laughs> shall, you know, shall means must. Um, so, yeah, so we kind of broke it down and really dove into, um, and I'm kind of going through this um, kind of slowly here so we can all digest it because we are, um, you know, Mia's not here today, but we were hoping to get, um, you know, some sort of a affirmative motion from the group to be able to send this memo <clears throat> onto uh, the PUC for consideration. And uh, it'll be something that we can revisit as we do have more of that information. Um, so yeah, so the in the recent uh, straw proposal um, uh, that came out uh, from the commission staff on July 10th, um, and that was about credit fulfillment plans and criteria, <clears throat> non-compliance and waiver process. There, uh, they laid out you know really five credit categories uh, or categories of credits uh, uh, to differentiate between them. To and these credits will come from low income, moderate income and really the non-LMI or market rate participants. Um, and then within each of the low and moderate income categories, uh, they further delineated between a generic measure and uh, uh, installed measures. So um, really, I, I think uh, the way I've been conceptualizing that is, of course, installed measures is, is what it is. And then a generic measure <clears throat> would be, uh, for example, a delivered fuel. Um, and so we, you know, in discussing this, you know, we determined that, as I mentioned, we need more information to really specifically say by what percentage is, you know, LMI credits should be front loaded, but really noted that the, uh, the five credit category framework <clears throat> really does lay the groundwork. And I, I think, you know, we, our discussion that we were having in the subgroup really identified that having that framework, I think, is key, or we think is key to uh, basically enabling, um, you know, future changes in, um, you know, how low and moderate income credits are uh, are defined in the future, you know, uh, looking at the uh, Queen Eats Standard Program as a whole, looking forward, you know, having these five credit, unique credit categories, um, will allow, yeah, the LMI credit market to be more closely tracked uh, to really inform any future increases or decrease in that uh, requirement. So, um, you know, we did in our discussion identify that this does add a, uh, a layer of complexity to the credit market, um, you know, because you're effectively going from essentially, you know, one, you know, we're just prior to this uh, PUC straw proposal, it's essentially just one credit market. And then of that credit market, you know, obligated parties uh, are required to uh, derive, you know, low and moderate income credits. But you know, by adding these uh, categories does add complexity, but uh, they're, you know, broadly, we thought that it would um, basically, yeah, allow, there's going to be a very distinct difference in these uh, credit categories uh, so that there is really uh, no confusion as to what credit market, you know, uh, you might be dealing in. Uh, if you have a, you know, low income installed measure, you know, for that credit market, it's very clearly a low income installed credit um, that is being dealt with, you know, or 
um, any transaction taking place in that space would be clearly defined. Um, and so having this framework set up would really allow for, uh, you know, these uh, very specific transfers of credits to occur. And then, um, you know, down the road, thinking about it from maybe a DDA perspective, or, you know, I guess I suppose it would be a DDA or possibly the commission perspective where they would be able to, um, you know, really hone in and identify where there are gaps in, um, you know, maybe compliance from the obligated parties or, you know, maybe it's more difficult to get a certain type of credit than others. And so, you know, these credit markets can be narrowed in on rather than, you know, fluctuating or changing the entire market, uh, credit market. Uh, that each of these categories could be kind of independently uh, dealt with, um, you know, over time. So uh, if we scroll down, we did notice that, uh, note that, um, you know, we had a section basically of the unknown information uh, that I've been referring to. Um, and, you know, we assumed that, okay, that the, the above framework with the five distinct credit categories, you know, will be part of the uh, the final clean heat standard framework and that, you know, really we identified some information that will be very important um, that will be needed to, to inform a uh, decision, um, you know, on front loading obligations, uh, you know, and the, the broader question of front loading those obligations. So um, we noted that, for example, the percentage of low and moderate, in, moderate installed measures uh, currently being produced relative to to all the cleaning measures would be great to know that would give us a sense of basically the existing uh market activity taking place in in the um you know the installed measure category the percentage of low and moderate income dry um delivered measures you know being uh you know produced uh again a very specific segment of the population but we'd be able to kind of um, it'd give us a higher resolution view of that. Um, and then, you know, we, it would be also a key piece of information is really the expected cost, um, you know, of the low and moderate installed credits. I think, uh, this, this answer will likely come from, um, you know, a, a default delivery agent, um, you know, that as we just saw in a recent, um, straw proposal put out by the commission in late July, the most recent one, you know, really gets at the uh, DDA uh, three-year uh, plan budget and planning process, um, you know, uh, and it kind of comes off on the heels of the obligated party compliance plan um, straw proposal. So, you know, the a DDA will uh, be essentially putting out their, uh, their plans and their budget as to how they plan to achieve uh, their goals for the three-year compliance window. And then, uh, you know, basically they will have a, essentially a, a pricing structure for each of their, um, you know, what they're going to offer the uh, obligated entities to essentially pick from and how they want to, and the obligated entities will know what they need to meet their obligation and will then contract with the DDA to meet those obligations. Um, after obligated parties, um, you know, post their plans with the, with the PUC, uh, the DDA can then uh, readjust their budget and plans accordingly, uh, you know, after looking at the, essentially, you know, the market demand coming from the obligated parties. Um, and so, again, you know, looking at it from a, you know, a low and moderate income or, you know, equity perspective, we, looking at this, uh, uh, you know, essentially the landscape that will be uh, shaping up, um, you know, the market uh, landscape that I'm describing, uh, having these distinct categories really will uh, go a long way to um, narrowing in the focus and um, being able to, you know, with uh, greater detail, um, move up and down um, and or, you know, adjust each of these markets to uh, suit the current market conditions without upsetting the entire market as a whole. So that's basically, um, you know, I kind of, I didn't read word for word, but that's essentially what we laid out there. Um, and we did have a discussion in the subgroup, um, you know, with Matt, you know, identifying that there is 
that added complexity and that can be uh, could be difficult to uh, you know communicating with those obligated parties you know this complex structure that has been created and it is <clears throat> worth noting that the uh, recent filings from the FDA and um, and the motion to reconsider you know kind of how the market is uh, you know shaped up um, I guess that was sort of a separate one but uh, yeah the uh, there's still uh, an ongoing debate about this and um, you know how it should all be addressed but uh, specifically with our memo here wanted to get some reaction from equity advisor group folks as to kind of what I just explained and what you're what you're reading in front of you so I'll leave it at that for now and open up the discussion if anybody has anything yeah Pike Go ahead, Pike yeah so we we notice we find that when their inclusionary zoning requirements in in um, zoning regulations, but there's some way of buying out. Developers will also often just uh, buy out, pay the penalty rather than comply with the statute. Um, I've suggested several times that there be something that requires um, um, the the uh, obligated parties to. Uh, not just front load, but ensure that uh, low and moderate income folks are um, getting what they are required to get under this law, and that is to not um, provide any credits until they've the, they first met their um, LMI obligations. I don't see that anywhere in here, and I have a concern that it'll be easy for organizations um, to just skip their LMI obligations, pay some alternative credit fee and move forward without kind of clear, strong language that they can't get away with that. Yep, so that definitely isn't in that memo. Uh, I guess, how would others react to that? I've got some thoughts, but I'll let other people talk first. I mean, you do make up uh, make a good point, Pike, because um, I guess in that uh, scenario, what you you could be doing is essentially passing the buck to the default delivery agent, um, which could then. Well, I, I suppose, you know, in, in the framework as laid out by the PUC's straw proposal, you would have, you know, the obligated parties filing their compliance plans uh, for the year to come. And then the DDA would have a pretty good idea as to, you know, how much uh, obligation they have to deliver on behalf of the obligated parties. Um, and, you know, if they're seeing a very strong signal that, you know, uh, the low and moderate income credits are being deferred onto them, then, you know, they would ramp up accordingly or, you know, make contingency plans to get those uh, LMI credits from, you know, through their network of for a suite of services. But I definitely see your point, you know, it seems like more of like an enforcement uh, point, but I definitely, I see where you're coming from. Um, and the scenario you just provided would kind of undermine the whole idea of front loading. If DDA is going to wait until they see some kind of um, um, sequence of events that, you know, is not meeting LMI requirements, you know, you've lost at least a year, maybe two before they notice that pattern and, and then try to move towards it. And, you know, if the statute requires front loading and and this would, your, uh, I would suggest that your, your solution would subvert the front loading process. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's a, I see where you're getting at. I, th I, I think the, uh, you know, my conception of it is that the, uh, basically the obligated parties, that this would occur at the beginning of each uh, three, for obligated parties, it'll be a yearly process as laid out in the PUC straw proposal. And for the DDA, it would be a, um you know every three year uh budget and plan um so they would in theory you know be notified of obligated party plans on a yearly basis for the uh upcoming compliance year um so yeah i mean they would know right up front you know for example at the beginning of their three-year window 
who, what kind of credits uh, obligated parties plan to produce for the low and moderate income sector for that first year of the three year compliance period. Um, so, I mean, they would know up front. You know, of course, there would be a one year delay on, um, you know, counting and verifying each of those credits uh, because they won't be reported till, you know, one calendar year after the, of course, the, the uh, compliance year started. But um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm talking quite a bit. I don't know if others uh, have a strong opinion on this. I I, I know Matt, you have a couple uh, words to say, but and before before we move on, um, Pike, if you if you are interested, would you be able to just write out some alternative text that you might um propose instead of um instead of what's what's there i think that would be that would help other people kind of visualize um yeah it wouldn't be alternative it would be additional but yeah i can get something out to someone sometime with the next couple of days okay That'd be great right. yeah yeah and go ahead uh matt if you had something to say yeah i just provide context to um our response to the straw proposal and also to the the term obligated parties and and how obligated parties comply so when you think about obligated parties it could be a very large natural gas pipeline operator or a very large wholesaler of heating oil or propane there's we've got four of them in vermont of those large wholesalers they're not going to know um, the economic status of their customers because, or the, the end user, because their customers are the retailers. So in that case, in order to fulfill their obligation, they have no choice but to do uh, one of two things. One is to acquire those credits in the marketplace where they can be bought, sold, bartered, traded, whatever, or to simply pay uh, the default delivery agent or to not do anything and then get caught and then pay 2x what they would have paid the default delivery agent. That's, of course, the third option. Um, so for them, it, how do they meet their LMI goals? They only really have one. They, they, either, they, either, they either buy them from someone or they just pay the DDA. Um, for retailer, the goal, of course, is to generate your own credits through by diversifying what you do, whether you sell renewable fuels or install eating equipment, eating services. And, and for them, um, and this is really the, the crux of our straw proposal, they have no idea. They have no idea how many gallons they'll sell, so they have no idea how many how, how many obligations they'll need. They'll have no idea how many clean heat measures that they, or energy that they'll supply because they can't project into the market. So we've created the straw proposal why we're very much against it if we haven't caught the drift yet. Is because it, it creates an untenable system in which the obligated party is not only responsible for coming up with the clean heat measures or the money, they're also responsible for predicting the future, something that the average fuel dealer cannot do. Not only can they not predict the future, they certainly can't put it down on paper in a legally binding document that they present in front of the PUC that shows what they're going to do, not next heating season, but the next calendar year. And that is what the straw proposal suggests. It will fail. This whole program will go up in flames. And I, and I say that with all seriousness, not that this isn't a good program or it couldn't be designed in a way that could work and actually deliver the results that we promised. This is not it. I appreciate the ability to have buckets so we can track whether or not we are helping low and moderate income Vermonters reduce their energy burden, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, reduce their costs. We should do that. This is not how you do it. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Michelle, I wanted to invite you if you have any any thoughts as well. I know this is something that the tag has been talking about in different capacities. My camera back on. Yes, I've um I think this is going to be very helpful. I see a lot of work's gone into this to Ben and the and the subgroup. And look forward to seeing this submitted so that we can continue so that we can discuss it as well i like the concept yeah and it, uh, um yeah it's really at this point as i laid out you know it's it's a it would be a concept kind of a, a framework by which to 
basically have uh, you know at the outset of the cleaning standard that could then be utilized throughout the program imp implementation. So, I mean, it might be something that we pass along to the tag for just just for visibility into what we are thinking here uh, from an equity perspective. And you know, of course, it was uh, the kind of the basis of this memo was grounded in the uh, PUC staff proposal. So it's my assumption that uh, TAG members have also, you know, read the uh, that staff proposal and, but are of course thinking about it from more of a technical uh, perspective. So they probably exactly. won't have some of the same uh, thoughts that we've, we've been coming at it from. So it, yeah, it um, if not submitted, um, you know, to the commission, I think probably a likely spot to send it over to uh, would be just tag just to get it. I, I don't see how that could hurt just to get it in front of more folks thinking about the same issues from the other side of the coin. Could be I think helpful. That's a great idea. Um, so, and, um, yeah. can you remind us what the timeline is um, for submitting to? What, what the imagined timeline was for submitting to the PUC and yeah um, I know that the well the the Shrop proposal it, that uh outlined the five categories of credits I believe uh Dominic could let me know the exact time I'm pretty sure that was already due uh the I guess that would be the criteria the uh, obligated party uh criteria and plans uh, that was already due to the PUC, but I think, you know, I think we were thinking of this as basically a, you know, an output of the EAG that, you know, we, the, uh, where we came up with this was all a public meeting and could be <laughs> rewatched as to how this was uh, developed. So it's not like out of left field or anything, but uh, yeah, Dominic, that has already been, that was already due that round of comments, I believe. Um, Cause DGA okay. plans and budgets, that's next Monday. Yes. Monday. So the original one was already due, but this memo or this set of memos goes a little beyond the specific questions. And by virtue of being a statutorily mandated advisory group, we are we want your feedback however and whenever we can get it. Um, as was talked about earlier on other topics, the earlier the better, uh, just from knowing the commission's meeting pace. Um, we have other big things on the commission's agenda for next week, so we won't be making any big decisions on this until at least the following. So, you know, if we can turn this around and get it filed in the case, um, you know, in addition to just send it via staff channels, it would be very much appreciated and considered. Great. Um, yeah, and it sounds like we're definitely not ready to move on this today because uh, Pike wanted to add some language, which, you know, we welcome and, uh, Getting that on paper will allow us to, you know, really digest it and give it give it some thought. Um, and that's really why we, uh, you know, Mia and myself and and Matt, you know, talked to, talked about this uh, the uh, not the DDA memo, but the the one about uh, LMI front loading uh, in a couple different meetings. So we had a robust discussion about it. So. Um, you yeah, know, would welcome additional feedback from the group. Um, so I guess with that, I can kind of shift uh, the discussion over to the default delivery agent, um, which is, you know, relevant for the current comment period. Yeah, Dominic, go ahead. I would be curious if people felt they might be comfortable um, taking an action on that previous memo. Um, if not for Pike's potential um, addition, I have some thoughts about um, what, what Pike proposed and how that may or may not actually work with the legislation as it's currently written. Um, if people are not feeling confident on making a decision in that uh, on that memo in general, then I see absolutely no harm in waiting um, and more fully considering uh, what what Pike is talking about writing. If that is the only thing holding up, we might be able to have a conversation about that and then move forward. So I just wanted to give that option to the group. Yeah, thanks for that. I um, I can say that Mia and myself are, you know, as we crafted it, so we, um, I can speak for Mia because she has, um, you know, let me know the email and, and in person that uh, she would like to see this passed along. So 
I guess other members of the group, how do you how do you all feel about it? Can we um bring the document to the to the part about um, installed measures? Is that possible? To take another look at that. Yeah, let's see. Well, there's a, a uh, you know, it's mentioned a couple times, but the, uh, you know, the requirement, of course, statutory requirement, um, you know, for LMI, uh, where the credits are derived from, of course, that refers to installed being half of that or statutory requirement. Um, let's see. Is this the piece that you're talking about, Emily? Um, let me see. Give me one second. I think it's the part underneath this, the red, the second red piece. Okay. And there is a comment as well. Uh, yes, yeah. So we were referring to basically the fact that um, installed measures, you know, and we can use the example of a cold climate heat pump, um, you know, inherently has uh, greater benefits for uh, the recipient of that measure than, you know, uh, biofuel does, for example. Of course, biofuel provides heat and keeps people warm and, and alive during the winter. That's very important. But a heat pump does the same thing while also providing um you know, basically uh, added value to the home in which it's installed, um, provides cooling, dehumidification, um, you know, psychological benefit of having a new heat heat source that is, you know, not emitting um, a direct, have any direct uh, carbon emissions coming out of it, et cetera. Um, so that's what we were trying to get at, basically, that um, an installed measure will be, bring uh, greater value um, and benefit to LMI households and a delivered measure. And we're just uh, kind of opining on the fact that um, given these multiple credit categories, in theory, if that framework was set up, uh, you know, a um, the price or the, um, I keep saying price, but, you know, it could be a number of, you know, aspects of each credit market. How, I guess uh, just to conceptualize the fact that you could adjust um, each credit market independently of one another. So uh, maybe, you know, the requirement for installed measures in, is increased, you know, and the delivered measures or generic requirements stay the same, I think is, is kind of what we're trying to get at. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt here because um, I was part of that meeting. I just want to clarify that, that with the way Ben laid it out. Yes, in many cases that's true, but not in all cases. If someone of low and moderate income has just installed a brand new, efficient B100 Beckett burner and a new furnace, um, then there might be a different perspective than someone who is has a furnace or boiler that's reaching its end of life. Uh, for that individual that has already installed a new piece of equipment, um, having a renewable biofuel is not only provides the best value, but the greatest carbon reduction versus someone who maybe has a piece of equipment that needs to be retired and having it in, in, in which case as, as Ben described is, is absolutely true. So I just wanna put that caveat there to anyone who sees that, um, that uh, installed measures are always provide a better value. That's not true. In many cases they do, but not in all. That's all. Noted, yep. Great point. So yeah, does that answer your question, Emily? There, or I don't know if you had a specific question on that section, or I think I just wanted to revisit it. This was, I feel like this took up most of the discussion in our in our working group on this, um, and I was just curious if other members had a reaction or thoughts to this. Um, I'm still kind of thinking through it, so just wanted to kind of yeah come back to this point. And so kind of make a decision in a future meeting, potentially at a, I mean, if we had, if you wanted to, 
I suppose what I might suggest is if members uh, like yourself or others do have specific questions on this, maybe um, they could make plans to attend the, uh, the subgroup meeting on credit issues so that we can uh, dive in, you know, in, in that uh, capacity and then maybe move it on from there if, if folks aren't ready to make the decision to move uh, at least okay. to pass this on a tag uh, today, you know. Well, Ben, let's let's maybe um, take a temperature read and do what sure. um, Dominic suggested. So Dominic was suggesting that there may be something that we can address um, specifically on Pike's point. Um, but in the meantime, maybe we can go to each of the members that are on the call right now and see if there's any specific objections to to what has been project, uh, presented. Um, and then we can um, maybe address those directly. So I'll just, I'll go around in the order that I see, um, see you on my screen. So um, Chris, do you have any objections or additional thoughts? I always have objections, uh, <laughs> but they're they're substantive. Um, mm -hmm. So the the challenge I, I always have is I, I got to go home on the you know when I go home on the weekends and I try to explain to my my parents like here's how this is going to benefit you. Uh, um, the the piece that really kind of resonated is you know they they live in a uh, an older home they just bought a new furnace. Uh, it's not going to be feasible to now just turn on a dime and switch to something else. So how do I, uh, it, it kind of resonated um, that uh, it's just, they don't have the money to go out and buy a new furnace. So, but they are sensitive that they want to have some kind of um, cleaner option available in the meantime. Uh, and if they can receive the, the credit from that. So I, I like the categories being broken out. Um, I, I just, uh, I wasn't clear on the, uh, the requirement to retire, um, that, that, um, Pike was suggesting of how that would impact that particular use case, or, you know, that's, that's a lot of situations that I'm talking to folks where, Hey, I just switched the propane from kerosene. Like, I'm not gonna, uh, unless you're paying for it completely out of pocket, I just, it's not feasible. So what's, what's. It's just not clear to me, like, which is the uh, best outcome for those for those residents. Yep, and I did just want to respond quick, Chris. I think he yep. was referring to the requirement for obligated parties to retire their credits. So he was saying that um, putting in a provision to basically that no obligated party gets any credits unless they've met their LMI requirement for that year. And then once they do, they would unlock their credits to them, I think is the concept he was going after. I don't think there was, there's no requirement to require some, somebody like your parents to now uh, buy a new furnace. That's. No, uh, I, no, I understand. It's just that, but there is a kind of an impact of if the, if there is um, a requirement to meet uh, that threshold uh, for them to get those credits, that does kind of have a downstream impact on folks of um right i mean wouldn't, wouldn't there be some kind of compliance fee that's now uh come into case because they didn't uh meet their requirement uh nope not, not for uh well for an obligated party yes right. yeah yeah it would fundamentally i understand pike's position i just disagree with it and, and the reason is it would fundamentally change the marketplace yeah. Or a wholesale provider of heating oil in state, so they're obligated, or propane, because they're in state. There's two of them in Vermont, um, propane, two heating oil. For them to um, not be able to utilize the DDA would mean that they only have one option. And it'd be to, to go into the marketplace where you could see, and maybe this is the intent, but you could see uh, an obligated party paying more per credit than the default delivery agent, was, which was originally intended to be the price ceiling. It's like, everyone's asking me the same question. How much does it add to a gallon of propane? How much does it add to a gallon of heating oil? How much does it add to a gallon of kerosene? We don't know yet. We don't know yet, but we will. And it will be set by 
the default delivery agent price, but not if all those LMI credits have to be achieved by obligated parties um, before they can access the DDA. And then you could see a scenario where the, the LMI credit price is substantially higher than the default price. And if you're in the business of installing weatherization to or heat pumps to low and moderate income homes, that's a good thing for you. But yep. that cost has to be shared and it will be distributed inequitably depending on where they live. We've got dealers, that, small dealers, I mean, 600 part. customers that have that, that have mostly Matt, trailers. I, yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Yep. I'm just going to quick, quickly move us forward to see if we can source out any other um, comments and then and then we'll, uh, we'll come to you as well. Uh, John, any any other? Yeah, go ahead. Just that I agree with Matt. Over and beyond that, I don't really have much to add. Awesome. Thank you, John. Emily? Uh, um, responding to the language that's in the document now, um, I I don't think I have any objections to share at the moment other than just I'm still thinking through the, the complexity and I'm not mm. positive I could uh, vote today. But I also don't want to hold the group up, but just sharing where I'm at. Thank you, Emily. Um, Rob, we're, we're going to come to you instead of um, in the place of Jeff. Sure. So. Uh, and with the caveat too that you know I that I plan on catching Jeff up on uh, what we were talking about, but um, the surface level understanding of what's going on, I have no objections to that uh, to what Pike was saying. Um, good, so leave it at that. Thank you, Rob. And then Matt, we're coming back to you. Yeah, I uh, disagree with the, the Pike proposal. I respectfully disagree with Pike's proposal. And and I'm, I'm uncomfortable and I wouldn't vote for it as written. I haven't done what I said I was going to do. It's my bad, which is to come up with some sort of language that I think would shave off the edges of the statement made that um, an installed measure is always of more value. I just don't believe that to be true. It can be, but not always. And... I think if we make a statement saying that that this credit is worth more than that credit, when they do the exact same thing in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I think we're putting our thumb on the scale and that's not equitable and our charge is to be equitable. So I won't vote for this. Thank you, Matt. And and just to clarify, this is this is not a vote. This is um more just figuring out um what objections we might have, what additional things we might want to add. Um and with that, I'll circle back to Pike. Any additional thoughts, Pike? Yeah, so the, my proposal was just one, um, and maybe there's a, a different way of achieving the goal, which is to ensure that, um, you know, the, the LMI group is actually going to, to receive the benefits of this uh, legislation. Um, I don't think that it's a workable solution to expect that the DDI is going to, you know, um, meet all the, the LMI obligations uh, it, itself. Um, and I don't think it's, it's really just for um, DDAs to, to kind of punt that obligation off onto the DDA. Um, maybe there are different ways of, uh, ensuring that the LMI group is, is met, um, other than, um, you know, holding back, withholding all the, the credits until those obligations are met. Maybe there's a other kind of incentive, but if it's just an alternative payment, I think we're going to see a lot of alternate alternative payments made in lieu of actual results provided to LMI uh, individuals. Uh, in households. And um, I think we need more than just an alternative payment. Okay. Thank you, Pike. So uh, I see I see a couple options that we can 
do to move forward. One is, um, it well, it one one option would be to vote now, but I don't think people are feeling comfortable taking a vote right now. Um, the other option would be to have people write in with um, kind of their additional thoughts, alternative, uh, alternative, um, alternative thoughts, and um, maybe meet during the all come together during the next uh, credit issue standing meeting, which will be on on Wednesday of next week. And maybe we can continue that conversation there. Um, one thing that is also on the table is whether or not we want to share this with the tag. Um, can I get kind of a head nod or, or a head shake of whether we're feeling comfortable with sharing this with the tag as it is? I see, okay, I see a couple head nods. Um, just, I did just want to point out, I mean, Matt, um, I, basically the paragraph we're looking at that I think Emily had some questions about as well as Matt, I think if we deleted that, um, that might satisfy uh, what Matt was saying. And also just, just want to remind everybody that uh, what Pike's suggestion is not currently in this draft. Um, and also just wanted to to kind of the discussion around what Pike was saying, um, there is a uh, all, the compliance payment to the DDA is double uh, is is a double payment. So um, that additional funding uh, statutorily has to be used to create credits with. So the DDA won't just take that and then profit. They're, they they do have to take that and you know create credits. Uh, so. The DDA also has an obligation to serve the obligated parties. So, um, you know, that that's the stick, I guess, uh, so to speak. Well, you know, obligated parties would still be getting their credits as they normally would. But, you know, if they don't, uh, any credits they don't produce for their obligation, they would be paying the compliance payment for if they said they were going to produce them and didn't. So just to, just to clarify for folks. Um, and the give it to, uh, give yeah, it to the weatherization folks. Pretty much, yeah. So the OEO, <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're, they're, we do know that um, OEO, you know, or any program that provides 100% incentive for their um, services will be receiving credit for it. Um, so right now, that's that's the weatherization assistance program. So they will be providing, you know, the lion's share of the low income credits, which will then, um, you know, generate revenue to further serve low-income folks as part of their program so we, we do know that so i just wanted to kind of throw that that make sure we're all on the same understanding of the landscape there yeah that ben that's an important clarification um I, I like your recommendation of about just maybe just nixing that one paragraph that we're kind of stuck on so we can move the rest of this forward um but I, um i did could i ask a question on that um weatherization piece is, is this sure. an okay time yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was kind of thinking about it, right? Like the, the weatherization program, um, if it were to receive, you know, this is going to generate some new revenue, right? Um, but the weather, the way that I understand the weatherization program really isn't 100% because there are some uh, caps or non-covered expenses, like really it's the electrical. Um, so I, I just, it, I, I hesitate a little bit when we say it covers 100%, but it doesn't. And that electrical is a is a big cost. Is this um, that that's usually is the barrier, right? Um, is this something where those credits could expand? Because uh, I, I know the program's kind of already built, but could that funding expand? So the out of pocket, if I wanted to switch to something, uh, my real out of pocket is you know as close to zero as possible. You got it. Yeah. So these credits would be used or this additional revenue would expand the existing program. Uh, right now, the with, due to, you know, the additional IRA funding and ARPA funds that the weatherization program has um, that they're currently utilizing, they actually, you know, if there is a barrier to weatherization, for example, at a uh, client's home, they are covering uh, everything at 100% incentive. So if they find, um, 
you know, significant wiring or vermiculite, you know, asbestos pipe wrap, et cetera, they're able to utilize federal funding to remediate those issues and get the home weatherized at no cost. Um, what they're not able to do right now is do service upgrades, for example, to, um, right. you know, they're able to put in a new furnace or boiler when it's unsafe, um, but they can't uh, just put in a, they can put in a heat pump uh, to supplement the heating, but if the electrical load of that house can't handle it, of course they can't do that. So really the folks that are some low income houses, you know, are, they're able to just, uh, you know, put a heat pump right in and not worry about the electrical, but you're right. Yeah. So these additional funds would allow, uh, increased access to, uh, fossil free heating options for weatherization clients. Yes. That's the, that's the, so just, just to pin that down just a little bit more. So would that be expand, are we talking about expanding that? So it would cover, uh, upgrading electrical, uh, that it doesn't cover now, or is it just, we have more money to do the same program for more people because uh, because it, it's the first. Uh, it's I, I would say it's both. I think it would ultimately be up to the discretion of you know Jeff Wilcox and and Rob and the, the team there um, yeah. as to how to utilize. They'll have to wait and see what kind of additional revenue they're seeing, and also this is going to bridge the gap, any gap that might occur from uh, the uh, completion of the IRA funding that. Um, they're getting a whole bunch of tranche of money from, you know, the federal government currently uh, as as part of the IRA funding. Uh, but, you know, we're looking out after, you know, in the 2030s when that cliff uh, funding cliff happens, we really um, this would help, you know, backfill that so that there wouldn't be as, as a drop off of funding. So, yeah, I mean, it, it just started. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sure. Sorry. Yeah, we're running a little late on time, so I want to make yep. sure that we get to everyone. Yep. Um, so we'll go to Pike, but then I also do want every everyone to think about what um Ben proposed, which was deleting the area that I have the paragraph that I have highlighted and and seeing if that is something that's worthwhile sending. Um, so we'll go to Pike, and then we'll come back to you all. Um to make that decision. We also want to keep room for public comment. So yeah, just keeping that in mind. Go ahead, Pike. Yeah, just a quick last question. You know, the, the statute suggests that it may be twice as expensive to um, weatherize, uh, bring up to clean heat standard, standard um, LMI household houses um, I think we've heard over the last few weeks that it's probably more expensive than that. So even at double the um, alternative cost, um, people will look at the, the, the alternative fee and say, that's a bargain. Um, and the, the folks who are stuck doing it, the, the DDA is, is going to be strapped because they're not getting enough money. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I am probably going to abstain on voting for this at this point. Okay, thank you. Hi. And so, yes, I want to do just a quick read on the group. If we removed the paragraph, the commission could consider, consider increasing some credit requirements individually. Um, this paragraph, uh, would we be happy to move forward with that? Just a quick pulse check, if you can give me like a head nod. Um, is, a, is that a sure. question, Emily, or is that a agreement? Yeah, question. Are you asking yeah, us to ahead. move this forward, like sending it to the commission or what we were saying to the tag? Go so ahead. this, I'm asking about sending it to the commission. So thank you for that clarification. So, so Shira, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I, I'm on a phone. I can't even read, even with glasses, I can't read what's being written. So um, okay. I can read it, it out. It, no, what I'm saying is, is there anything that prohibits us from having a vote by email um, after we and others that can't attend or had to drop off can can read it fully? So that would be a question for Dominic on procedures. Um, pulling back up the procedures, um, I'll tell you that that was not anticipated. Um, I can't say with confidence that it's disallowed if we read it 
back. Well, no, because the business needs to take place within the meeting. So I, I'll double check, but I think unfortunately no. Okay, then yeah. that's fine. Now that I'm here, it would be an open open meeting day. Yeah, I'll vote against it then. If you if you decide to vote, vote. I can't read it, and I'm not going to vote for something I can't read. Um, so it's also in the chat. Um, you have the documents, so I, if you're able to read them quickly, it it might be helpful. I can also read out loud the um, paragraph that we are talking about getting rid of. Would that be helpful for you, Matt? Uh, can you email the document? I can't read it off the screen, but I. But if you it's, can email the, the document. It's also, it's been previously emailed. So it's in the um, agenda and resources that I sent out this morning. I didn't get that or I didn't, I did, I didn't. Oh, okay. I see it. Okay, great. And it's, what's the title of it? Oh, my credit. It is EAG recommendations on front loading. Okay, so we'll give everyone a minute to read over it. In the meantime, we'll go ahead. I know that we have a couple public comments, so we can do those really quickly. As a reminder, uh, we are keeping the public comments to two minutes each. Um, and we will start with... Uh, Sorry, it, shoot, it looks like he might have left. I think Jeff had a question. Okay, we'll go with Jeff. Um, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I, I'm a longtime energy consultant in Vermont on renewable energy and energy efficiency. I've participated in a number of studies uh, and a number of programs. Um, uh, what my concern is is that that you know we're not going to get this perfect. It's it, it's it would be impossible to get it perfect right off the bat, um, and and time is uh, it is relevant. How do we, you know we need to do something, and and we need to do it as quickly as we can. So um, uh, I would encourage you to keep keep working on this and uh, submit it within the uh, the time frames that um, that are uh, statutorily required so that we can make some progress that's that's all I got thank you thank you so much Jeff yes and I know that Carl also had something to say he called me on the phone but it looks like he is off so sorry to miss him um are there any other public comments? Okay. Has any does has everyone had a chance to read over it and has access to the EAG recommendations on front loading? Okay. Are there any other um reservations about um voting on this now? Matt, I want to be sure to give you a chance to read it as well. Yeah, no, nothing's changed here. And uh, yeah, I still can't support it. Uh, it still is based on the framework, which I think is faulty, which is set up by the PUC straw proposal, which requires us to predict which buckets we're going to earn credits on and penalizes us for, for doing something that's completely out of our control. So I cannot support this. I will not support this. Okay. Thank you, Matt. So. I would propose um, taking a vote on whether or not we are able to send this document um, after we've removed uh, this paragraph on the commission considering increasing required requirements individually, taking a vote on sending that to the PUC and, and we'll figure out the next steps after that, after that vote. Um, so would anyone like to make a motion for that vote? I'll motion that we the EAG uh, sends this memo to the PUC for consideration as part of the rulemaking process. Thank you. And so for all of those in favor, would you please raise your hand? So I see one, two. Um, Rob, I see your hand up. 
I'm sorry, we, we're, we're taking out the commission could consider the, we're taking out the red part. Yes, yes. Okay, then yes. Okay, so four with Chris. Okay, and those who are opposed? See Matt and John. And those who are abstaining? Okay. So as it stands, we can send this uh, to the PUC, um, removing the additional paragraph. Um, sure, the only thing I ask is that you note that the, the who voted uh, the number and those abstained. Okay. And I would like to, yeah, go ahead, Dominic. Um, Matt, I recorded the number. You also want the names? Okay. I, I, you're muted, but I presume that's a yes. Chris, Ben, and okay. And in an effort to make this stronger, Matt, I would, Matt and John, I would welcome your written response, uh, written alterations or written uh, responses so that we can um, provide that as well. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have very little time. Um, I will hand it over to Emily very quickly to give us an update on the public engagement um, subgroup. Um, really quick, it was just Ashira and I this morning, um, so I'm going to take a go at drafting up like a really rough um, one pager describing the public um, pathways to engage with the clean heat standard. I'll be editing Jen's introduction paragraph and then um, just like creating a diagram that includes some of those pathways and um, I, that's just going to be a first go and I'll share that with the PUC and the public engagement group. And once we have a real draft, I'll share that with the EAG before we move forward. And if anyone in the meantime has pathways um, that may not be on the top of my head for the public to engage, feel free to send them my way. Thank you so much, Emily. And moving into next steps. So uh, we encourage all EAG members to respond to the F to the VFDA filing by um, August 27th. Um, we encourage anyone who um, has additional comments on the credit front loading um, memo that we are sending to the PUC to send written, um, written comments so that we can um, incorporate not incorporate them, but um, add them as well. Um, and Ben, will you be in charge of sending, sending, submitting the credit front lo loading memo to the PUC? I can do that. And I, I don't know if we need a, like a to amend the motion, but I also wanted to. Can we send that to the tag as well? Uh, I don't know if we need a separate vote for that at this point, but I guess I. I don't think you need a second boy. Uh, you you plan on filing this in EPUC, correct? Uh yeah. Yep. Great. Then we'll just we'll notify the tag and get it on their agenda. Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Brings us to the close. All right. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ashira.